um, try and uh, cater for a possible wide range of interests or, or um, what I would imagine the interests um, uh, in what I'm going to be talking about. So this talk is going to be covering a range of things including you know, polycystic kidney disease, why does it happen, the genetics, how does it present, how do we treat it and what are the things that we typically look out for. It will be going in a range of depth, so sometimes it will be quite simple, sometimes it will go a little bit deeper, I'm not going to make it overly complex. Um, and I'm very happy if anyone has any questions, just throw your hand up, um, cut me off me way through, and I'm happy to field questions as we go, um, because I, I tend to forget by the end of a talk the question I had, you know, if it happened at the start. So please stop me if you don't understand, if you want me to clarify something very early, it's a small audience, I'm very happy to, to field it the best I can. So, Polycystic, no, I'm joking, I'm just going to scare you. Uh, I'm going to be going in quite like that. So, overview, overview of what I'm going to be talking about, first of all, will be a little bit of a delving into what is polycystic kidney disease, an understanding of, you know, one, you heard the terms um, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant, dominant, what does that mean? How common is it? Who gets it? How do we diagnose it or how is it picked up? And what are some of the common um, presentations? And then what are some of the common complications that tend to come along with polycystic kidney disease? Uh, and then we're up to with treatment. Um, a little bit later on, I'll be also talking about some of the uh, research in polycystic kidney disease, which um, there are um, active uh, things happening with Canberra and also across Australia. And I'll be just touching on some of the advancements or, or trials that have been uh, going on across the globe, just to give you a, an idea about the landscape of advancements in the treatment of polycystic kidney disease. So, I guess the first thing, really the easiest thing to dive into is that, to say that there are two classic forms of, of polycystic kidney disease, and we, we refer to those as autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. And I know many of you would have already understand a lot of this, but I can't assume that everyone has knowledge on that. Just bear with me. So, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant just describe a pattern in which genes are inherited, and we apply that to a lot of conditions outside of polycystic kidney disease. Um, most of what we'll be discussing will be revolving around autosomal dominant, and that's because it is by far away much more common. Um, autosomal recessive is much more severe and happens much earlier in life and has a very high mortality rate. Um, I'll touch on it a bit, but a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the burden um, of disease and a lot of um, the patients that we treat are dealing with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Now, it's important to say that some individuals have what looks like polycystic kidney, well, they have polycystic kidney disease, but it's actually just kind of a side, of, uh, kind of a, a side <coughs> of involvement when they actually have another condition such as uh, um, polycystic liver disease. So they may look like they have polycystic kidney disease, but actually it's the liver that's the primary issue, and they happen to have a couple of cysts in the kidneys, and, and that's, a very, that's handled very differently to, to the liver uh, and to how we handle the kidney disease. So to explain recessive versus dominant, eye colour is always a very easy one to understand. I think we all, we've all um, kind of appreciated that, you know, if both of your parents have blue eyes, um, you know, if we look here, there's a, um, point is, uh, point is you have a, a brown, brown eye and a blue eye. Now, I actually am a good example of this. So my mother's Dutch, she's got blue eyes, and my father's Chinese, he's got brown eyes, so I, that's actually me. I've got a blue, a brown gene and a blue eye gene. Um, now, um, if my wife had both you know, brown eyes, then all of my children would have brown eyes because anybody that inherits this gene, so we all have two copies of, of each of these genes, my children may inherit my blue gene or my brown gene. If they inherit the brown gene, which is what we call dominant, and dominant means that when you get that gene, you will develop a characteristic. So if you get the brown co eye colour, your eyes will go brown. If you have a blue gene, which is what we call recessive, which means that you have to have two of those in order to, for it to develop. So blue is what we call recessive, autosomal recessive. So if, in order to have a blue eye, blue eyes, you need to have both of your eye colour genes being blue. But if you inherit a brown, any time the brown appears, any time anyone inherits a brown, they will have brown eyes. So what that means is brown is dominant. Whenever it exists, it will, um, you know, it will overcome the blue eye gene. 
in order to have blue eyes, you can't have the brown, you just need to have both of, the, both of the blue eye genes. So dominant just means that there is a gene when present, it makes you develop some kind of characteristic, black hair, dark skin, blue eyes, height, weight, things like that. Now in the absence of that, there are some conditions where you have to have both genes to be a particular type, and we call that recessive. So for polycystic kidney disease, the two major types are autosomal dominant. And so most of you would be familiar with autosomal dominant is where um, one of your relatives may have a single one of these genes. And then if that gene is passed on, then generally speaking, the individual that inherits that gene will develop polycystic kidney disease. So the recessive type is where both the parents need to have one of the genes and they both come together in the child and then they have the disease. Now if they only have one of those mutations, they're what we call a carrier. So they, they run around carry, they, with the, the, the gene, but they don't have any, any system in the kidney, they don't have any uh, health problems relating to the kidney outside of, you know, relating to that gene. But when the two term, come together, generally it, it's quite severe and, and about 40 or 50% of, of children, or, or I should say fetuses that, that are homozygous will die in utero or within the first couple of months of life because of those mutations, so those genes. So we say dominant is a single gene that tends to pass in it. If you inherit it, you'll get disease. Recessive, much rarer, and you need to have the same mutation from, from both your parents to have it. So autosomal dominant, as I mentioned, is much more common. So um, I think globally they estimate that it's the fourth most common cause in the world for um, people requiring dialysis or kidney transplantation. Um, diabetes and cardiovascular disease is one, RGS2 and then there's another um, form of autoimmune disease at some three. But certainly number four, 30% um, of individuals uh, under the age of 50 will require dialysis and that's data from the United States. So it's a very common um, condition and it affects all racial groups, different variations. So you can see here Japan, they report that perhaps one in about 4,000 live births will have poly polycystic kidney disease. Whereas in the USA, it's about one per 400, one in a thousand, and it's similar in, in other parts of Europe. Um, over here, I mentioned autosomal recessive, that's what AR stands for, it's about one in 26,000, so a lot rarer, um, a, a lot rarer condition. Uh, and then, of course, when people get autosomal recessive kidney disease, it's so severe, generally, um, you know, they don't survive into childhood, uh, past childhood. Those that do actually have a very good outcome. Um, but the, instant, the, the, the number of cases in the general population is low. Did somebody? Right. Okay. Why? Why is the US like on such a high and such a high number? Well, probably I suspect it's more has to do with detection than anything else. Because a lot of them are going to be essentially European in nature. So I think more, and, and this is something that puzzles to places like Africa and, and in Asia where the rates are reported to be a bit lower, it's probably just the healthcare system is a bit better and the pickup rates, the people are better trained and the pickup rates are much higher. So when we talk about um, these dominant, so there are kind of dominant versus recessive, there are two big genes which people may have heard of, the PCKD, PCKD1 and 2 genes. So about 80% of individuals will have the polycystic kidney disease 1 gene and about 15% will have the, the PCKD, PCKD2 gene. So, and then there's about 5% who have, who, you know, when you look at their genome, they have not, no mutation in either of those genes, uh, and they're thought to be other genes outside of those two um, which have a, a disease, which present very similar to, to these two. So 95% of autosomal dominant will be due, due to these two genes. Um, just pay a little bit of attention to that because they are important, they behave differently in terms of how they um, go to develop kidney disease. Um, um, I'll come to this in a bit, but the number one, the PCKD1, is a bit more, tends to be a little bit more aggressive than number two. Um, uh, but I'll come back to that. Now, recessive, there are a number of genes, but by far and away, 95% are going to be due to this gene called fibrocystin. So you need to have two mutations in fibrocystin, they come together and then you get very severe disease, and I'll show you a little bit on that. So this is um, the, functional, the functional unit of the kidney. So what we have here is this little ball, uh, and we call this the glomeruli. Uh, and so many of you would have heard the term glomerular filtration rate, and that does the functional work of purifying the blood. 
And this is uh, what we call the tubule, where we concentrate all of our salts and hold on to fluid, and, the distal, uh, and then this is the distal collecting tubule, and then the collecting duct, and this is where all the urine gets formed and comes out. So this is a, a normal nephron. What we see with, um, what happens when you have um, a mutation in these genes, the polycystic uh, kidney disease uh, and the PKHD1 gene, you start to develop formation of cysts alongside the tubules. Now most of them will occur here in this downstream bit, um, the distal uh, uh, collecting tubule and the collecting ducts, uh, but some but they can occur anywhere along this, um, this uh, tube. So what happens is you have the tube that drains out of the kidney, very early on, one of the first things we see is that um, people will have difficulty concentrating their urine. Over time, what will happen is the, the skin, there's kind of the cells that line that tube will start to separate out and, and start to secrete fluid and eventually will separate themselves off and wall off and become outright cysts growing off the tubule. Over time, these cysts get bigger and bigger and, and more of them form. And that's really the basis behind what happens with polycystic kidney disease, is that these cells are getting an abnormal signal, and I'll come to that in a little bit, and it's causing them to divide and form up a cyst around in, in, that, in that tube in the kidney, and those get bigger and bigger and bigger, and more of those form over time, causing a number of issues related to pressure on the surrounding tissue and effect on inflammation in the kidney and effects on, on, on this function, you know, the, the glomerulus. <coughs> um, any questions about that? That's a bit... Any questions? Okay. Do stop me if I'm going too far. So, I don't want to get into this too much, but I just want to make very briefly just to say the interesting part about this um, is that really both these genes, the, the PCKD1 and, and the PKHD genes, where they actually functionally exist is on these little hair fibres, essentially, that sit on the cells on the, the, that line the tubules. And so when you get a mutation, the mutation in these genes, it makes those, that, those hair fibres stop working properly. And so the cell can't tell what's <coughs> happening in the, as the urine flows out. And so it starts sending strange abnormal signals inside the cell, causing them to divide. And that's what leads to them spreading out and forming these cysts here. So here's what you can see is an early um, division of the cells, and then they'll become like this, where they kind of um, pow, out pow, from an outpouching while they're producing liquid in here, and then they round themselves off and form a cyst, an outright cyst. So that's what happens kind of at a continual uh, process over the journey with um, <coughs> disease. But of course, everything in, in, in medicine and science, these things are not um, perfect. So when you, an, an individual has a mutation in these genes, it doesn't automatically mean that they will get severe disease, it doesn't tell you very well whether the disease will, will manifest with um, end-stage kidney disease at the age of 25 or at the age of 75. There is a very wide variation um, when people have one of these, a mutation in one of these genes, a very wide variation in how people will end up uh, and how people will go. Now, there are a number of reasons for that, and I won't get to it, but part of it has to do with other genes, um, other parts of the family. And other parts of it has to do with your environment. So the things that you eat, the illnesses that you get, um, the lifestyle that you live will all modify whether the cysts um, start to grow large quickly or they start to grow later on in life. The, the estimates, though, when we look at kind of genetically identical people, so twins versus just siblings, is that about 50 to 75 percent of, of where of how someone's kidney function is going to go over time in polycystic kidney disease. That relates to genetics, which means that 25 to 50 percent of it is lifestyle, and it's not just the gene; it's, it's it's other genes that you inherit with it. So, as I mentioned before, those um, when we do sequencing and identify the mutations, there are the PKD1. So, this is for autosomal dominant kidney disease. Most um, individuals by the age of 70 will require dialysis or other, some other form of renal replacement therapy, such as a kidney transplant. However, the people with the PKD2, if the PKD2 gene is involved, um, only half of those individuals um, will require some form of either dialysis or kidney transplant by the same age. And so generally we say that those with the PKD2 um, mutations will have a, a, slight, a better prospect of a, of a good outcome than those with number one. And there are other things that we can look at in the genes which, that, that kind of give us an idea about whether the mutation is likely to be more aggressive um, 
or not. So there are parts about the nature of the mutation that can tell us whether kidney function is going to get worse or whether we expect it's going to be a, a slightly more indolent form. Look, um, I won't really get into this too much except just to say, in fact I won't get into all, just to say that really what I want to highlight again is that having, if, if, you know, because this is dominant, if you have this one of these um, mutations and you pass it on to your child, it is not necessary, um, that's not the end of the story in terms of whether the mutation is going to cause problems with your kidney. There is this idea, um, a, a very active idea in research and in, in kidney medicine that the cysts, uh, that there is a dose of these genes, PKD, so this is for, for, again for dominant polycystic, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, that you, there is a dose of normal gene that you need and as you increasingly drop that dose, the severity of the polycystic disease increases. So the mutations themselves may not necessarily mean that you end up on dialysis or that you will have aggressive, um, aggressive polycystic kidney disease, but there are a lot of other vari variations that happen over the course of someone's life that can determine whether you know, kidney function declines rapidly or not at all. So just summary about, the, about that, so there's a recessive form and there is the dominant form. The recessive form generally you know, is very severe because very early on in life and it's very uncommon, very rare. The genes, um, uh, and autosomal dominant is, is technically uncommon but is one of the most common causes of kidney disease, uh, kidney failure. Um, it's highly variable how the genes translate into um, uh, an effect on kidney function. And, and that kidney function is influenced by factors outside the genes themselves, although the gene, the nature of the mutation does have an effect, it does have implications for the kidney function, it's not the end of the story. Does anyone have questions just about the, the, that, uh, kind of un, a bit about the genetics and, and the description? Can I just ask, yes. sorry, yep. uh, can I just ask that you were saying that uh, the mutation doesn't totally define the prognosis. Yes. Um, do you, or does the profession have much of an idea of what other things do influence it and what are yeah. the main things that influence it? So there are, well one, actually one part of it is other mutations. So, so what I mean is for, for all of us we have genes and there are other genes that have an effect on that. So, the reason why two brothers may both inherit the same mutation from mum or dad, and one of them may end up requiring dialysis or renal replacement therapy at the age of 35, and the other one is 65. And so the one of 35 thinking, why we have the same gene? Why am I on dialysis? Why is he running around with EGFR at 40? So there is a maybe about 50 or 60 percent of that um, is going to be other genes. So what they may do, for instance. Um, is switch off, so, so this is dominant, and so you have a normal healthy version of those, of those genes. So the gentleman who is on dialysis may have had another mutation that switched off the good gene, and this other chap didn't inherit it. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of mutations, and as we go on in life, this is thought to be one of the other things, is that as, as we go on, which is what starts to manifest more in kind of your, your, your late teens and your 20s, is that we, we accrue other mutations as our cells normally divide, and that can knock out the good gene, and then you have both of them affected, and then the cysts start to accelerate. So unfortunately, genetics is probably a large part of it, but that genetics, you, the, what that second hit is, we don't understand well, and I'll touch on that a bit in the research. And other parts of it are kind of the classic things as well. So people who have injuries to their kidney can trigger the process where the cysts start to develop and grow. So, People that come in, you know, have a bad urinary tract infection, become septic and land up in hospital and get a bit of an injury to the kidney. Now that injury to the kidney itself can set off inflammation and, and, and trigger acceleration of that process. So, and then you know, smoking and exercise, and basically all those things play into kidney health. So anything that can injure the kidney can trigger it as well. So it's a bit of an environmental, other genes outside the classic ones we test for, um, those are the things that will modify whether the um, if we were already isolated the gene, mm. and you know that the progression of the disease is when one 
RNG and starts dropping, then surely there's got to be, there, there is some progression within gene therapy going on to counteract that. Yes. <laughs> It's, it is a bit complicated. Like, so, so part of the work that I do is, is, is kind of essentially like gene therapy. Yeah. And, and there is this new technique that came out about five years ago where we can actually jet, edit the genome of live cells. So that, that exists. It, unfortunately, it's a bit more com complex than that. So it's easier for some of the work I do in the immune diseases because the immune system is always developing. But when you've got your kidneys which have already developed, so you're an adult, you get diagnosed, they're there. Um, there's not a very good way of editing the genome of every cell in the in the kidney. Now, if if we had a, a child with a very like you know, you could do it. And so someone who got fired in China because they actually tried to prevent HIV and they edited a genome of a human, which was unethical. Um, but they tried to do it. But you can only do it when you know the egg and the sperm first got in, because then you can do it because when the cell divides and everything is edited. The issue is actually figuring out how a way to do it in the kidney when it's already established and. Actually, they have tried to do it, but people died, so, um, <laughs> no. All right. So now, perhaps, that, that was just a bit, a bit to understand the nature of those that are going to be interested. Now, a bit more um, about the, the clinical side of things, so it'll be a little bit science heavy. So the presentation, how do, how do people with polycystic kidney disease present? How, how are they often uncovered? So, um, by far and away, the two most common um, uh, referrals that I receive in the clinic. One is for an incidental diagnosis. So someone's gone to have a CT scan because they turned up, you know, with some other thing and it's found that they had multiple cysts in their kidneys. Uh, and then they refer, do you think this is polycystic kidney disease? Um, the other most common is that uh, you know, there is an affected relative and we want to, I want to be screened and I was screened and I found to have um, multiple cysts in my kidneys so I think I have polycystic kidney disease. That's going to be about 95% of presentations with polycystic kidney disease. <coughs> Rarely or uncommonly, we have people actually presenting symptomatically with pain, maybe a cyst has ruptured or um, uh, someone's bled into a cyst. They may have a feeling of fullness. That's a bit unusual because that's quite, um, you know, it's quite advanced by the time someone's really feeling you know, very presenting with bloating. Uh, and sometimes it's found with just incidental discovery of high blood pressure and then we go and have a look at the kidneys and discover, oh, oh hang on, it might be um, polycystic kidney disease causing high blood pressure. In order to diagnose it, this is, this is actually very tricky, and I think perhaps I should highlight, first of all, and the reason why it's a little bit tricky is this, um, uh, this point on, on, on your right. So cysts are, are actually pretty common in the general population. Now, by ultrasound, so each of these, the different ways, and I'll, I'll go over this in a little bit, but the ways in which you evaluate cysts you know, differs. Uh, and insensitivity, but if you have an ultrasound, use an ultrasound, which is the most common method of evaluating them. Um, in the general population, under the age of 30, you shouldn't have any cysts, but if you have one, you know, it doesn't mean that much. But about just under 2% of the population between the age of 30 and 50 will have a cyst, one or more. Over the age of 40, up to 70, about 10 or 12% will have a cyst. So, Having one or more cysts in the kidney um, is actually quite common. It doesn't necessarily mean you have polycystic kidney disease. And so what we've tried to do is establish um, a radiolo radiological criteria to diagnose those. Myself here. So often we will use ultrasound because, and I'll go over this because it's, it's cheap and relatively effective and safe. Now, to diagnose that, and this is un undergoing some modification based upon genetics, at this point in time, but for simplicity's sake, we would normally say that when you're younger, because we accrue cysts as we, as we grow older, you should have greater than two in one or both cysts, uh, kidneys if you're under the age of 30. Um, and if you're 30 to 60, you have greater than two cysts in each kidney, so at least four. Uh, and over 60, greater than four in each kidney. And so those have to be, have to be a, a, a individuals who are at risk to have a first degree family member. Um, who also has um, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Um, if somebody is unknown, and I have patients who are, um, have been adopted and, and simply discovered to have polycystic kidney disease, um, because you don't have that family predisposition, we say that if they're under the age of 40, they're going to have more than three uh, in one or both. 
And then it's similar to, to kind of the regular one where it's more than two or more than four if you're at the age of 16. Now, uh, magnetic resonance imaging is probably going to be the other um, modality that we'll use quite common. I think that's going to be increasing more and more. Um, MRI is getting cheaper, uh, and there are other things that are, um, other reasons why MRI is going to be better than ultrasound, but it's kind of the, the field is shifting a little bit at this point. So, MRI is much more sensitive than ultrasound, which is why we say here, um, you, you have, to more, have more than two between the age of 30 and 59, you have to have more than six um, in a similar age range. And that's because MRI is so much more sensitive. So with ultrasound, we get a probe. Some of you would have had this. You get an ultra probe running over the back, and sometimes the sonographer misses an assist, runs the probe in the wrong direction, it's on the wrong axis, and they can miss assist in the kidney. MRI takes the whole thing and can see all the hidden cysts deep down inside the kidneys and things like that. So it's a much more sensitive test. And so based upon that, we see you have to have more than five in each kidney if you're under 30, uh, and then six or nine. Um, depending upon your gender. So just very quickly, uh, a clinical thing for, for those of you who, who do have surveillance. We we'll generally use ultrasound. I think it's a quite a, it's a reasonable, uh, and um, uh, it's cheap, it's reliable, reasonably reliable, uh, and there are no real side effects to the probe aside from the gel going in the back and being cold. Um, there is lower sensitivity to detect cysts, but really once you have a diagnosis, if you're, if you're just monitoring how the cysts are going, I think it's, it's reasonable. Um, CT scans are sometimes used. Uh, I don't use them. One, because they're more expensive than the ultrasound, but most importantly is that every CT scan has ionising radiation. So if you're using that CT scan a lot, you're increasing your risk of having cancer with every CT scan. So if you're doing something where you're going to be imaging indefinitely, a CT scan's probably not going to be the way to go. Um, but it is much more, it's much better at picking up cysts than an ultrasound. The MRI, it's expensive, but getting cheaper and much more common. Um, minimal side effects, very good at picking things up. And um, the Mayo Clinic is now leading um, studies looking at using kidney volume, of which MRI is the best um, tool to measure kidney volume, as a surrogate marker of how kidney function is going to go. So generally speaking, if someone is going to follow up, probably MRI, but we're not quite there yet. So the first thing with um, the kidney, the, the, the kidney volume, as I mentioned, so the normal, a normal volume of the kidney is about 150 mils. Um, on average, when somebody will, is first diagnosed with polycystic autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, it's about a litre. So it's 10 times normal. We know that as the volume grows, it will grow in an exponential fashion, so in, in, in greater and greater absolute volumes every year. And that goes up about 5% every, every year. Now, we do know that the speed of rise, so the light, the quicker that they grow, that generally will correlate, as you'd imagine, with the decline in kidney function eventually. Um, so there are two measures which we, we can use now in our context in treatment about how severe or how aggressive um, the, the kidney disease is. One of those is, is the kidney function dropping, which some of you may be used to uh, have experienced. Um, you know, that, that assessment. And the other one is, is the kidney volume increasing? So there's a lot of research now in using increasing kidney volume to prove before kidney function drops off and using that, that rise to pick up whether people have more aggressive disease and whether we can treat that um, earlier. Um, so yeah, so, so volume, so um, baseline volume predicts increase volume. Baseline volume predicts the, um, whether there's an inc a, a, a reduction in kidney function or an increase in volume. Um, and declines in kidney function, the kidney function really will start to drop off after a litre and a litre and a half. So many of you will have heard about, uh, will have heard about the kidney function test we use, which is called an estimated <coughs> glomerular filtration rate, or EGFR. So that goes for a range of above 90, you know, down to, often won't get below 4. Um, oops. Uh, excuse me. Now, generally the mean decline in kidney function is going to be between four and five mils per minute per year, and, and people will approach a need to having dialysis around about 12 or 13 mils per minute. So if you go from 90, um, that drop, you have to get all the way down to around about 15 to 12 when we start to think you're going to need some form of kidney replacement, a transplant or, or dialysis. Um, as I mentioned, kidney size correlates with the kidney function, so the larger they inversely correlate, the larger your kidneys get, 
um, the work generally values of significant gain worse kidney function. The decline is variable from person to person and even sibling to sibling, as I mentioned before, um, this with Robert, depending upon a number of factors beyond the gene. However, overall, whether you're PCKD1 or PCKD2, the two different genes of course the dominant, uh, about half of individuals will require, will require some form of renal replacement therapy by the age of 60. Um, hemodialysis, where we take the blood out and purify it to um, do the function the kidney can't do, um, or transplant uh, are more common. We can sometimes do dialysis through the tummy, but often because of the size of polycystic kidney disease, uh, polycystic kidneys, uh, it means that the, the membrane used to dialyze isn't as good. So PD tends to be used not as much, but if the kidney size isn't too big, we can, we can do that. I think generally speaking though, uh, transplant is going to be you know, always everybody's preferred option um, if there's no, contra no reason why they can't have So just another thing uh, uh, for those who wonder, we should also should always have your urine checked as well for protein in the urine. So this is one of these other modifiers. The presence of protein in the urine is, can be is associated with more aggressive, faster decline in kidney function, and it's one of the things that we actually can change a little bit to to kind of make the decline in kidney function not so um, aggressive. So if someone, not everybody has protein in their urine when they have polycystic kidney disease. But when you do have it, there are blood pressure medications that we can prescribe, some of you may already be on them, which can reduce the protein in the urine. And, and for patients with polycystic kidney disease who have protein in the urine, we have been shown to delay that decline in kidney function or slow it down. So um, do, it is one of those things to check whether you have protein in the urine or whether you're on kind of a maximum protein um, reducing agent. So what I, is there any questions about that part, uh, about the kidney related bit, before I just move on to um, the bits outside of uh, kidneys? They're all related, but no. Okay. So, with polycystic kidney disease, if the kidneys are just a one part of um, uh, one part of how we are, are looking after um, individuals. Beyond the kidneys, there are a number of other very important considerations and other um, ways in which polycystic kidney disease can manifest. Blood pressure, um, I think the one that many of you, uh, you know, would have read about or considered would be also the presence of intracranial aneurysms, cerebral aneurysms. Um, heart involvement is not uncommon, but often doesn't need intervention. Um, kidney stones, and I will go into this in more detail, kidney stones, uh, infections, and then there tends to be cysts also within the, the pancreas, the liver, and, and for men um, within the seminal duct, um, but doesn't always, is not often associated with problems with fertility, but I'll go into these. So blood pressure is, you know, for kidney specialists, our bread and butter, we deal with it both in and out of um, you know, individuals with polycystic kidney disease and those without polycystic kidney disease. And it is controlling blood pressure in kidney, in any form of kidney disease is absolutely crucial. As, you know, Half of blood pressure, as I said, was one of the ways in which people can present with polycystic kidney disease. Um, yeah, for people with uh, the autosomal recessive form that appears very early on, at the age of five, they can be diagnosed with high blood pressure, which is very uncommon uh, in, the, in the general population. So 50% of patients between the age of 20 to 34 with polycystic kidney disease will have high blood pressure, hypertension. By the, stay, by the time it reaches end stage, which is when we require a kidney transplant or dialysis, essentially everybody has high blood pressure. The reason why this is, it's important to pay attention to this is that blood pressure can be missed and you, you have to do a very thorough assessment of, of whether high blood pressure is present because it's one of the things that we can modify to help protect the kidney. So a spot blood pressure when you just go into your GP's office, you can usually do three in a row to get a good average measurement, um, actually probably isn't adequate enough. We know that over the course of the day, individuals' blood pressure will vary. And often we can actually diagnose, at, when we go to sleep at night, we will go to, our blood pressure will drop. And some individuals are what we call, um, you know, they're not nocturnal dippers. So their blood pressure doesn't come down, and we call that nighttime high blood pressure, nighttime hypertension. So they still have hypertension, it's just that if they're not seeing their GP, it's not getting picked up. So, Generally speaking, if an individual has been identified to have polycystic kidney disease, um, if they don't have a diagnosis of blood pressure, they should have a baseline evaluation 
a 24 hour blood pressure monitor, which comes sometimes a bit annoying to wear, it inflates kind of every 10, 15 minutes like for 24 hours. And if there's no evidence of blood pressure, then we can go and check it again in, in three years' time as a, as a rough idea. Now, it's important that we keep blood pressure really under 130 over 80. Um, higher your blood pressure, the greater the decline in kidney functions it is a general rule. Um, the blood, you know, higher blood pressure causes inflammation and scarring in the kidney, and that the kidney function that remains can become um, quite severely affected um, if high blood pressure is allowed to exist. Intracranial uh, aneurysm, or cerebral aneurysm. So I think this is the one that, uh, you know, as a kidney specialist, probably you know, the, the polycystic kidney disease, we can observe it, we monitor it, we understand it, it's a bit predictable. And predictability kind of breeds comfort in us. I think cerebral aneurysm is one of the ones that, you know, uh, uh, you always have to treat with a lot of respect, um, both as a patient and, and, you know, as a treating physician. And the question about how to handle it or, or investigate it is, or often is a tricky one. So about 8% of all adults with polycystic kidney disease will have some form of aneurysm. And about 21% of those who have a family history of someone, a first degree relative, having had an aneurysm. However, most of them, the vast majority of them, when we do screening, um, are very small. And they sit in the front, the blood vessels at the front of the brain. And the risk of bleeds with those are, are, are vanishingly low, so they're very low risk. The reason why screening is indicated in everybody is that one, it will breed, you know, most people will become a bit anxious about it and want something to be done. But the reality is that when you actually step back and look at what are the complication rates when you have the procedure, the coiling or um, um, the band that can happen, that they can do to, to kind of clip the, the aneurysm, for un the, the risk of side effects are actually higher under seven millimeters than the risk of actually having something happen um, when the, the cyst is small. So generally speaking, most international guidelines, most experts would agree that individuals who you offer MRI screening to are going to be those who have a first degree relative who have had um, a cerebral aneurysm and a bleed, or an individual who's in a high risk profession, so bus drivers or a plane uh, pilot or something like that, because if they have a bleed, then that's catastrophic for everybody on board. Um, or also in indications in, in, are individuals who have a lot of anxiety about the possibility of having had an aneurysm, and those are individuals who will walk to the screen. But generally speaking, I'd say that most nephrologists um, would not routinely MRI everybody that has polycystic kidney disease, particularly if there's no family history. Um, if there is a family history, then yes, it probably should be done. Very quickly, just move over because we're running short of time, but um, heart involvement. Now, it's very common, about a quarter of individuals will have an um, involvement of the valve, and that can sometimes affect the, the, the blood vessel that comes out of the heart. But often we don't, if it involves the, the blood vessel around the heart, then that needs to be monitored. But if it involves the valve, often it doesn't re require surgery or any kind of intervention. So um, we don't routinely do um, ultrasounds of the heart to investigate it unless we can hear a murmur when, when we examine um, an individual. About a third of the individuals will have a bit of fluid around the heart called pericardial effusion. Normally we leave it alone and it comes and goes, unless it starts to kind of put pressure on the heart and then sometimes we have to do some things to relieve that pressure. And there is a very rare condition where the heart muscle starts pump, it doesn't pump very well, uh, but it's vanishingly, vanishingly rare uh, and often we just treat that with um, some medications. Kidney stones, very common, up to 60% and they're typically of one kind, calcium or um, uric acid. Now both of these, uh, we, we can give medications to control. Um, uh, you can give um, things to lower uric acid and also to re reduce calcium. It's very important if an individual does have an episode of um, kidney stones, particularly if they're pre-dialysis, that they have that, um, they, they seek medical attention in the emergency department. The reason why I say that is if the stones block off, that can damage the kidney itself, and every insult to the kidney can accelerate cyst growth uh, and also um, reduce the kidney function that's there. So if an individual does have sudden onset of grabbing pain, killing pain in the side, it's important that it's looked at um, uh, and make sure that there's no stone there. Uh, and fluids we'll come back to in a little bit. Um, now I'll touch a little bit on tolvapsin, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, in the real world, it is a little bit unclear about this, this medication. It has shown some promise and we're still trying to understand um, well what its role is or the safest and the best place with which to use it. So tolvapton um, was designed uh, to 
it, it, it targets receptor has to do with um, how we uh, how we how we produce um, our thirst receptors. And one major trial published it would have been about ten years ago um, with a follow-up trial that kind of showed the same thing has really given us a good idea about how well this agent goes. Now, I don't want to stress people out by putting graphs up here, but I do want to highlight one point, because um, tolvaptor was the first medication that came on the market, which has been approved, and it's approved in Australia, we can prescribe it, and it's subsidised by the PBS. And it was the first medication that was made, was used and, and um, approved for the use of polycystic kidney disease. Before this, we really only had kind of lifestyle modifications and things like that. Now, this is, this is really, the important thing to say though is although it shows some effect, these are, each of these dots is an individual um, who's participated in the trial. Red is the people that got, they didn't know it, but they didn't get told about it and they got a sugar pill, essentially. Blue is the individuals who got the medication. They're all randomised, no one knew what anybody was getting and they followed up for three years. What we found, or what was reported in that, in that study, was that you see a very small decline modest line, but significant um, difference where those who are on the top had a slightly st slower growth in the kidney size. And so that was a surrogate marker for kidney function as mentioned before, so that was already primary here. Here what, we, what they say, so this is another way of measuring kidney function, you can see these, this line that runs through here is just the average, average over time, so 4 months, 8 months, 12 months, 16 since they started taking the tablet. So, tolvaptin and placebo both decline, and there is a very, a very small difference over right here in whether those individuals have a, 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 you know, a, a change in their decline. But it was significant, so, so it wasn't due to chance. There are kind of mathematical things we can do to tell. So it was real that there was a difference, but it was very small um, in the study. Um, they followed up for a number of other years, and so I just want to show you, because this is a, a, you know, one of the big things with polycystic kidney disease. What they found was that this, this here is kidney, um, kidney volume growth. And what they found was that effect in this trial, so this was 12 months, 24 months, and 36 months, so three years, treated with sugar or treated with tolvaptin. We saw this quite a significant difference where tolvaptin kept things smaller. Uh, and part of that was kept, but really we saw that really those, those that, had, that, that had been on the placebo uh, had a little bit of a benefit, but still the cyst change in kidney volume persisted and, and, and perhaps was not as great as we had hoped. However, this is the follow-on uh, with the changes in kidney function, so I think this is going to be the big one. So essentially what this shows is that if you start on tolvaptin later, they still, uh, those that start on tolvaptin early, sorry, so this was a study where they gave the sugar, cube, the sugar, sugar pills and tolvaptin, those that received the tolvaptin still, um, compared to those that received receive the sugar pill, had a sustained reduction in their kidney function over time, suggesting that this medication is going to be effective in preventing decline in kidney function. The big thing, uh, unfortunately, with tolvaptin was some of the side effects. So they always have to report whether a, a tablet can be tolerated. So there's no point having a miracle cure, a uh, miracle tablet, if people can't take it because they feel so sick. So one of, the, one of the big things is that people tend to be quite thirsty and go to the toilet more, because that's how the, this um, tablet worked. So if you receive the placebo, about 20% of people um, felt like they were really thirsty, whereas half of the individual on top of and felt thirsty um, most of the time. Uh, going to the toilet at night, rates are about double than going to the toilet during the, during the day. But those things are kind of not terrible, they, they can be managed. The things that we were most concerned about was just the rise in, in liver function tests. So there tends to, there was a greater rise in liver function tests, which can sometimes be a mark of inflammation in the kidney. Um, but nowadays, if some of the newer studies that are coming through suggest if we keep a closer eye on liver function, we can sometimes uh, get in early before the liver becomes um, damaged. But that is one of the adverse side effects of this medication, one of the reasons why we, we are a bit cautious. So, treatment summary, well, generally what the approach would be, aside from you know, the other things that are associated with kid, um, polycystic kidney disease, is one is to control blood pressure, that's essential, and general cardiovascular health, so keeping your weight low, exercising, cholesterol, the normal things you do to look after your heart, your brain and your kidneys. Um, water, I'll touch on in the, in, in the research section, but drinking water is one of the big things, trying to keep your urine as dilute as possible, I'll explain that a bit more later. Limiting salt, because that will drive blood pressure, 
thirst and, and also mean um, that it can drive cyst growth as well. We will screen for cerebral aneurysms, only in individuals who are at risk. Uh, and we do consider tolvaptin for individuals who, who appear to have aggressive, um, aggressive kidney disease. Any questions about that? Sorry, it was a bit of a tour of course, but mm. any questions about that at all? Just one question. Yes. The amount of water you have to drink yes. um, is quite a lot. It's, re it's very restrictive. So, yes. Um, the trial that I'm going to discuss a little bit later on, which is going on in Australia now, running out, running out of Westmead, um, is actually saying that it's not a fixed amount, but it's actually enough to. So we analyse the urine of individuals and make sure that the urine is very diluted because that's the real thing that we're most interested in, right? having diluted urine. Mm -hmm. Because that's where the cysts are, you know, the urine is diluted and we're suppressing things there. So, but those individuals end up having to, you know, study anywhere from three and a half, four, and then some people need to be able to go four and a half to five litres. Mm -hmm. You know, day, that is hard. That's yeah. really hard yeah, to do. Yeah. So look, and so that's and that that's the good thing about this this the study is that it's a very practical one, the trial that they're running, because similar to the top app, there's no point prescribing five litres of water if no one if no one can drink that. I mean I would struggle to drink five litres a day. For individuals, if they may go three and a half or four litres, then it might be three and a half maybe possible, but yeah, it can be onerous. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, please join with me in, in uh, thanking uh, Dr. Zhang for the first part of this talk.